Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining and welcome back to Wall Street Silver. Joining us today is Jeffrey Tucker. He is the founder and president of the Brownstone Institute. He is also the former editorial director of the American Institute for Economic Research. Welcome back, Jeffrey. It's good to be here. Thank you. Yeah, always great to have you on Wall Street Silver. I wanted to bring you on to talk about everything that's happening in the economy. Uh, we'll start off first with uh, gold and silver. As always, where do you think gold is going from now uh, to the end of the year? Do you, does your outlook change from the last time we spoke? No, I mean, you see more and more central banks accumulating it, and there's a major challenge to the dollar going, and the dollar is not, they, the challenge is not coming in the form of fiat, it's coming in the, in the form of hard currency, who can accumulate the most and, and get enough uh, power, national and multinational power to challenge the U.S. in the age of imperial decline. So, you know, and once again, it's, it's amazing. Here it is 2024. <laughs> It was a century ago, I guess it was John Maynard claims, uh, claimed that gold is a barbarous relic. Um, it's back. Yeah, it's, it's it's for sure back. Like everyone's been talking about it. Central banks are buying it up. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's super, it, it's super interesting because, uh, you know, these wars, it doesn't look like it's going to stop anytime soon. Russia, Ukraine, everything that's happening uh, in the Middle East. What's your opinion on that? Do you see that the geopolitical issues uh, affecting the price of gold, or is it just both that and a monetary uh, policy issue that's uh, helping gold increase in price? Uh, the Great Set ha Great Reset has many elements to it. It means economic cartelization, corporatization, surveillance, censorship, uh, gr growing amounts of uh, economic decline, inflation is all over the place and not going anywhere. I'm, I'm more and more looking at these charts, thinking we've been through wave one. Right. Um, we could, you know, have another wave and another wave after that. Uh, it seems like, and I have to credit EJ Anthony at Heritage for figuring this one out, but surreptitiously about. Uh, four years ago, the Federal Reserve basically raised its inflation target from two to two to three percent, mm -hmm. and never told anybody. Uh, but this is a creepy thought because up to now, I've seen all these reports as being terrible news, terrible news, right. terrible news. They're still not getting their target, but it's always reported by the BLS as being cooling, calming you know, falling back, normalizing. I and mean, this has been three years of 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 cooling, settling down, normalizing inflation levels. And yet you look back at the last three years and what you see is, you know, anywhere between a tw 25 and 75 percent decline, <laughs> decline <laughs> in purchasing power by the dollar. This is it's never gets better. And yet it's always reported to be getting better. And suddenly with with his little chart that he he published, I'm suddenly realizing, oh, yeah, they have probably changed their target. It's gone from two percent. Now it's a solid three percent. Maybe it's maybe it's going to be three point five percent. So if they're if they're hitting that target, they're happy. And you see M two rising again. Yeah. And and Powell's now talking about the thing is Wall Street's so massively addicted to credit that it's going nuts anytime this guy says he's going to turn on the spigots again, which is <laughs> deeply embarrassing for. Anybody yeah. who believes in and capitalism, you know, to to see Wall Street just dancing only for one tune only, and that tune is cheap credit. Mm -hmm. It's it's it and unsustainably cheap credit. You know, at a time of unconscionable levels of debt in government and households and corporations, it it the only way to keep going is through more credit creation. So if Powell's dangling the prospects of rate cuts during what is really in reality what we used to call an economic depression and, um, and combined with, with inflation, unlike the 1930s, where at least we had the advantage that the dollar was growing in value. At least we right. have that. <laughs> we don't have that anymore. So this this sort of stagnation is, is, is the norm. And the idea that Powell would be talking about rate cutting right now is amazing. The big the big news from Powell's speech yesterday is that we got for the very first time an acknowledgement that the neighbor, labor numbers we're getting for the BLS are not correct. No way. Uh, and that was huge. Uh, and what's funny about the world in which we live is that we're it's weird. It's 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 big news 
when an official source confirms what everybody's already known for three or four years. Right. That, that, I mean, how often does this happen? I mean, it hap happens every day uh, that, oh, the CDC has admitted something that everybody knows. Uh, yeah. Now we've got uh, Powell admitting something everybody knows, and namely he's drawing attention to the huge divergent, bet divergence between the establishment numbers and the household numbers that that diversion is so large that it makes a difference between dramatically rising number of jobs and dramatically falling number of jobs. Wow, time jobs. So that's how big the divergence is between the numbers. It's this between like you know it's so, it's, it's like you know night is day and day is night. You know, uh, and so, it, it makes everybody live in a false reality, right? Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. that's exactly it. And I I'm just publishing a story should be should be live in about an hour or something like that on on a new survey. I think it's from um, Clancy Clancy Capital something. Where okay. They called a bunch of hiring managers from top corporations to find out uh, you know the the underlying gritty reality of of their uh, job opportunities, their their public postings <laughs> of jobs, and it turns out that that half of the seemingly legitimate jobs posted on indeed and other major job platforms are fake even on their own yeah company that's website. that's crazy <laughs> yeah did you read this and <laughs> no and, i didn't read this uh, well and once you hear it it just makes perfect sense so they're doing this to create the appearance of a booming you know uh, company to mm -hmm. boost their stock price and attract job uh job app applicants so they can say to their existing job holders listen there's 250 i'm sitting on 250 applications for your job right now you know causing them to get alarmed to work hard and not ask for too high a pay increase right um and, and and to create the appearances of of a growing uh, of a growing uh, business to boost the stock price and and then um and then also a lot of these companies during the the, the boom of the last uh, 20 25 years where they got you know throwing labor at every every problem with infinite right. amounts of resources there's all these companies have large divisions devoted to recruitment and posting jobs and if they're not posting jobs they're not going to keep their own jobs so yeah. there's, <laughs> so we're in a weird world where anybody in the who's looking for a job very quickly realizes that all the jobs posted on Facebook or LinkedIn are fake, uh, you know, pyramid schemes or, or, or right. whatever. And then the actual legitimate jobs at legitimate places like indeed, and so legitimate that the federal reserve still reports the indeed job index. Well, it turns Do out they actually, yeah. in like oh. three different places they're, they're relying on indeed. I mean, you can understand why they did it. Like, oh, well, here's a respectable job marketplace. Let's track what they're doing to get a better picture of the economic right. reality on the ground. Well, it turns out it's so bizarre because the, now we're talking about the supply side of the job picture, even in the gritty job marketplaces is 50% fake. That's and everybody who's ever been in the job market knows this. You know, you dump applications to everybody and never hear back. Um, and then you've got the the supply side is fake too, because you know vast numbers of job applicants aren't actually looking for a job, but rather uh, ticking off boxes to prolong their unemployment uh, or right. disability benefits. So you know, when the supply and demand are both illusions, there are sector wide problems. So what what would break first in your opinion? Do you think would it, like if there's a sector wide problem and there's an illusion of a false reality where, you know, we think the economy's fine when really it's in a in a really terrible state, then uh, then yeah, what would break first here in your thing? A, a bank collapse? Would it be real estate, commercial real estate, or well, we've already it's... seen commercial real estate in cities uh, t tanking. You know, much the crisis is is basically unreported, and that's going right. to affect the big banks like we've talked about right. before. So we're going to see that unfolding of that reality through the next year. But on the on the macroeconomic level, I think we're going to see the real pressure and the real turning point is with is with retail sales. So. And this is a weird number because we keep hearing retail sales are up, retail sales are up. Oh, this right. is a retail-driven economy. Um, and as strange as it is, these numbers are are never reported officially 
uh, in real terms. They're they're only reported in nominal terms. So if you buy right. a hamburger this week for ten dollars and you pay twenty dollars for the same hamburger next week, the government says, "Wow, we've seen a one week one hundred percent increase in retail sales of hamburgers." This is literally what they're doing. That's crazy. It's crazy. I don't understand it because they report real GDP all the time, right? They report real income all the time wrongly, but they report it. So they're adjusting by the CPI as fake as the CPI is. <laughs> you should at least use the numbers you have. But retail sales and factory orders and all these other things, they're looking at straight up dollar amounts, not the actual things being purchased. So they're wow. looking at overall volume of sales as measured by the comings and goings of dollar bills rather than adjusting them. And then once you adjust them, you find the retail sales have been flat for years, flat and falling for years. Now, if we go from, from flat and falling in real terms for years to tanking, and mm -hmm. there's we have several signs uh, of that occurring just in the, in the, in the last several weeks, um, and this happens when uh, house, households reach the end of their rope, you know. Right. Yeah. Um, where, 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 and people are already thinking of, of of fast food as a luxury good, but but when that happens, when the when 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 you go from just getting by to oh no, I'm in the red, right. uh, you know that is going to uh, people just, uh, tighten their belts to the point that it's actually going to tank. Lots of small businesses, in particular, and then and then we could find ourselves in. I think we're already deep in in recession, that from which we never recovered in twenty twenty. But you right, know, things can always get worse, and I think that could be a turning point. Absolutely, yeah. There's there's so many things happening in the world. Do you hear what happened in Calgary with their water or their water main? Like sixty percent of the the city doesn't have like clean drinking water. Uh, that doesn't surprise me. Every aspect of civilization is under stress right now. I mean, even our access to food is is coming into question. We've got uh, str strange things happening with this with the the hugely fake bird flu scare. Yeah, yeah. So you know, we're seeing you know millions of chickens being slaughtered, and and people that are uh, cattle cattle ranchers are are panicked uh, about these PCR tests, which they're urging everybody to do, because if one cow tests so-called positive. It doesn't mean sick. <laughs> it means that the PCR test found the evidence of bad play. You got to start um, slaughtering all the all food supply. Slaughtering all the cows and then and then clamoring to, to the USDA, you know, please, please market my product. And then they don't have any product and they're not ready to go to slaughter. And everything gets more expensive, prices. And then food, it's going to go up. And, and so every every farmer and every rancher is, is, is absolutely in panic about this. And then you know, you wonder why is this happening? And by, by the way, there's nothing wrong with you know if you, if you're a farmer or a rancher, you know that some animals get sick and they die. But that's but and they expose other animals which don't, and that means their immune systems grow. But this kind of talk that's like is, just like humans, you know, we get a yes sick. Like, <laughs> it's just like humans, and but this kind of talk is not even you know uh, admitted to anybody at the Department of Agriculture right now, which is operating very much like CDC. For animals, yeah, <laughs> and the reason is that they have, you guessed it, an mRNA product uh, that they're trying to. Uh, yeah, yeah. Market, Actually, la is. last year I think it was Pfizer was working on a bird flu vaccine. They started one last year. Yeah, I know Moderna has has one apparently, which yeah, they're yeah. which they just sold to Finland. So yeah, this is this is this is our new reality. I mean, it's it's like forever ruled by by big pharma you know the most powerful industry in the world <laughs> probably more more powerful than than the, the munitions manufacturers and congress point. and congress and all yeah it's a <laughs> it's all very it's all very strange so yeah we've got a threat to the food supply right now well the food supply is already threatening but you know better bad food than no food yeah and you know I, I read an article i think this was like two three weeks ago there was one uh farming uh, there was one chicken plant where they killed like millions like it was like two or three or four million chickens because they found bird flu there yeah and we've got this very bizarre uh crackdown going on on raw milk right now and and what what's funny is that there's a huge booming industry in raw milk like all over the country oh milk. yeah yeah raw milk is <clears throat> is probably the best thing for you yeah well you know uh 
that's not what the FDA says, but, uh, <laughs> but, but a lot of people swear by it, you know, yeah. and, and you can't keep it on the shelf anymore. So there's, there's a huge boom in raw milk production, still a tiny percentage of the market, but, but, but now you have the department of agriculture working with the FDA, you know, with their state counterparts to shut down all these raw milk organic farms, whether Amish or just, you know, uh, mm -hmm. crunchy, crunchy left wing. I heard, I heard even almond milk uh, doesn't have real almonds in it. Is that real? <laughs> <laughs> that's, what some, that's what someone was saying. I don't, I don't, I don't care about freaking almond. It's not even real anyway. I don't know. Yeah, that. yeah. There's nah, a bunch know. of different. But, yeah, yeah. Things. So, yeah, yeah. but yeah, yeah. Let, let's just say that that of all problems in the world, uh, uh, raw milk is is not a great problem. But that's what we've got government focused on. So, yeah, um, crazy. so they're they're using the bird flu crisis, and so the and the, and the great fear. So, what is there to be feared from from bird flu? And uh, of course, it's zoonotic release into the human population. Since uh, data going going back thirty years, you know, says that um, of the six people in the history of the world that have that have been infected by bird flu, three died. You know, forty years ago, <laughs> whatever the thing is. The fact is, that bird flu in humans is not a, a threat. I mean, the worst that anybody can come up with is it gives you a brief case of conjunctivitis. So yeah, the the drive here to create this bird flu frenzy is is the marketing of the vaccine. But you know, I'm looking at at the the situation here and wondering what actually stops this trajectory. I mean, what what is to prevent them from rerunning the whole COVID story, you yeah. know, chapter two in a slightly different way? And it's not clear to me that there's anything to stop it. All the bureaucracies are in place all the protocols are in place right right everybody and people say i won't comply well you won't comply but everybody else is going to comply it'd be like all the right. big businesses or, or if they're scared into complying like something big oh, like, like like let's say uh, power outages in in major cities or the water supply for like 80 or 90 percent of the to the city goes out and then you get everyone to comply people will be scared on the streets They've got ways of making you comply. That yeah. is, and they're absolutely confident of that. So it'll be a different kind of uh, scenario the next time. But um, and this is, I'm afraid, how we're going to greet uh, something like a financial crisis. It will be a diversionary tactics. It will be yeah. uh, wars and uh, disease scares and all these other sort of dy dystopian uh, stories. So they can just watch any 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 one of a dozen. Uh, dystopian movies and and that all, is our, all our it takes is really yeah. one one cyber attack to like a major bank of like a few million people if you just like if everyone wakes up one morning and there's no money in their account like two three million people if there was like a cyber attack that would that would probably do it too yeah uh, people are concerned about you know the magic atm you know is it going to give me my cash or you know the first time their credit card doesn't work you know that's right this this happened in 2008 you know the the bailout uh, was had was gaining no traction at all people were like oh people can't spend my money on the big banks that's bad <laughs> and then uh B george bush announced that the AT atms were running out of out of cash no way seriously that's real yeah he said you know we got to pass this thing or else you're not going to be able to get cash out of your atm no and he, yeah he just said it and passed it and that's what triggered it Suddenly, people start screaming. So you know, this is the this is the thing. You know, governments and and, and ruling classes learned that you can control people through their pocketbooks. That's that's right, the answer. Right. People yeah, yeah. will do, do anything to keep the cash flowing, and especially under our present conditions of three point two savings you know, percent savings rate, sky high revolving credit card debt, paying 20 22 percent, you know, interest, um, declining full time jobs. Yeah, under under these kind of collapsing conditions of household finance, people will do anything to was keep. Was it was it Congress too not uh, trying to pass the bill back in two thousand eight, or was it just like was it the people that didn't want to pass the bill? Why? Yeah, no, Congress didn't want to. Nobody wanted to bail out the big banks in two thousand eight. Right. But 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 it it flew through as soon as there was a threat to people getting getting their cash. And that was in two thousand eight when people would frequently. You know, go go to the magic box on the in the corner of the street and put in their magic card and get their magic money out of the bank. And as soon as there was a threat that 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 wasn't going to happen, um, 
that's when that's when the bailouts just flew through. So mm-hmm. yeah, the bailouts happen under conditions of 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 panic, you know, when oh. we saw the disease panic in 2020 that resulted in, you know, whatever, five, six, eight trillion dollars in spending, you know, it was un- unthinkable amounts of money. And then the Fed got busy p- printing like crazy, all because uh, the World Health Organization started flinging weird data around and strange things. Well, we got a 2% for sheep issues. <laughs> Uh, case fatality rate, uh, CFR, and the infection rate of you know, 3%, and all this kind of stuff, and it's spreading all over the place, and, and yeah, it's terrible, terrible, and lively. And so, people just you know, began to see things that that weren't real. I mean, the 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 scientists all screamed that that the virus is, could be anywhere and everywhere and on anything, or wow. you know, and 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 that was enough to cause people to let go of all their senses and Congress to to do unthinkable things, you know. And, yeah, and yeah. they set the world on fire. And here we are, four four years later, with you know inflation that's uncontained. At the same time, every news report is saying it's contained. It's high. No, it's low. It's getting worse. Same, no, it's getting better. Same thing with the this this flood in uh, in Cla- in Calgary with the water mains breaking, the major yeah. ones across the city. I watched the news on it last night, and it's like, just like what you said. Oh, they're looking into it. It's getting better. There, they have stages of uh, fixing it. But then they just show the streets just all flooded, <laughs> and no, and like sixty, seventy percent though don't have like water, and it's just crazy. I know the distance between the reality on the ground and what you're hearing from the top is so huge. I I was talking yeah. to my friend, uh, economist Peter Saint Ange this morning. I said, um. Why is it there's only like a half a dozen people that are drilling down into the job side of the output data and the CPI data and the PPI data and actually telling the truth about it while the whole right. of the mainstream media is saying otherwise and the academic economists are silent and all the the other financial uh, economists that are telling the truth are, are behind proprietary paywalls for only for the customers only. I mean, this is a weird situation. Um, it, it reminds me of what it must have been like in 1935, you know, in the, in the thick of a of a deep depression, which we now know. But every but everybody was you know singing, "We're in the money. We've got enough to get along. Everything's going to be fine." You know, watch your movies, stream, st- you know, go go to the theater and watch Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. Right. So, um, and and there turned out to be, you know, looking back, yeah, about a half a dozen people. Who were telling the truth? Benjamin Anderson and Henry Hazlitt and H. L. Mencken, just a handful of other people, and the the whole of everybody else was was denying the reality that was right in front of your eyes. Right. And it's just amazing that you know, ninety years later, we're we're dealing with an almost identical situation. It's absolutely mind boggling, and I, I, you know, I face this. Um, Basically every every week with with the jobs data in particular, but but inflation inflation data, um, PPI last month was terrible. I mean, it confirmed you know, a a basically like a five month upward trajectory and reversal and declines from the previous year, uh, which is a forecasting of higher inflation. Well, the PPI came out today with a, a big drop, um, and I haven't check to see what the spin has been right on that. but they're probably going to be probably warning you know the coming deflation right but but when you actually drill down to the data a 60 percent of the supposed decline one month decline in the ppi was due to a fall in the gas price that has already reversed itself <laughs> that's crazy you know so whatever seemingly <laughs> Good news you want to take from the PPI this month, as versus the catastrophic numbers last month, are no longer even true based right. on real time data, which you can find out by going looking at you know retail numbers that are being reported in real time. So you know it's this is the world in which we live. Wow, you know it, it's gonna get it's getting crazy, and uh, you know it's, it's, I'm so glad that you came on today to talk about everything that we did. Uh, talk about Jeffrey. It's such a huge pleasure you coming to to Wall Street Silver, and I'm sure, uh, I'm sure we're just waiting for the next thing to happen, whether it's a bank collapse or uh, something big in the market. 
uh, whatever it yeah. is. Uh, but, yeah. You know, but the important thing is it doesn't have to be something big. And that's, oh. the, the, I think what we're seeing is a, 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 you know, evidence of a four year long decay, you know, and it's, it's weird because it follows certain paths of the past when you see in developed economies and in high inflation. So, there's a lot of economic activity, a lot of money coming and going, a lot of money changing, a lot of people making money, paper profits from, from finance. But meanwhile, there's this underlying decay and people's household finances are not working out. All their money is locked, locked away in retirement accounts and uh, you know, moving from day to day. And the optimism has been completely drained out. So it's like this decay of fundamentals has become precipitous and obvious to basically everybody, while the optics and the veneer of economic activity and, and profitability is, mm -hmm. uh, is, is everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. Well, again, Jeffrey, it's such a huge pleasure you coming down to Wall Street Silver. Good to see you. Yeah, yeah good to see you. And as uh, everything develops, I'd love to have you back on.